Well, welcome everybody today to Lifeline Church. Come on, if you're excited to be here, can we welcome our first time guests too? Come on, let's go. Very good. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Hey, we got a mission here. If you know it, you can say it with me. It's to be a lifeline by leading people to becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. That's our mission. That's our hope is that everyone would find their place to that to that, to that end game right there of being a lifeline to others, that we would know God, that we would end up finding community, that we would discover our purpose and ultimately be a lifeline. Man, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what we get really, really excited for every single week. Now, if you were handed a, uh, a bulletin walking in, now's a great time to take that out so you could take some notes with us. I know, I'm looking around, note takers. I can see you. You're note takers out there because you're, you're smart people. I can, I can just see it all over you. You can take out that bulletin you were handed on the way in, or if you like doing it digitally, you can, you can download the YouVersion Bible app, which the link is up on the screen for you if you like that. I love this app, the YouVersion Bible app, because it is a wonderful way to be on a Bible reading plan every day of your life, which every Christian ought to be reading a little bit of their Bible every day, and I, I stand by that. <laughs> I really do, and this app really does help to have a chapter or two to read every single day. And as a bonus, you can make Lifeline Church, your home church in that app. Wow, high tech, right? And you can follow along with all the notes that we have here and stay up to date with things that are going on in a Bible app. That's, that's pretty neat. I like that. We are in part four of a series called The Bible, Creativity at Its Best. I know, I know. Part four of this series where we've been going over the five categories of the Bible. We went over history, we went over the prophets, we went over wisdom and poetry, and uh, I'm just really excited about this. We got two more weeks left, this one and one more. I'm really psyched, psyched up about it. And it all comes from this scripture right here in 2 Timothy 3, says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, makes us realize what's wrong in our lives, it corrects us when we are wrong, teaches us to do what's right. It correct. Oh, excuse me. I already read that. God uses it to prepare and equip his people. (laughs) I like that. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. What that means to me and what this whole series is really all about, a growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with God's word. That's what that means is a growing relationship with God. This is his, these are his words to us. This word corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right. So a growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with God's word. Last week, we had a lot of fun talking about prophecy. Yeah, it got live in here. It was fun. It was cool. I, I, didn't, I didn't speak like a prophet. Y'all going to hell. No, I didn't do like that kind of prophecy. But we talked about the, the prophecy literature, which is the largest category of the Bible, and the least understood category of the Bible. Can I get an amen? You're like, no, I'm not saying amen to that. I want to understand it. That's good. We talked about what prophecy means in, in today's church. And we talked about some of the Old Testament prophets and what they did, what they went through. You can go back and look, look at that on YouTube. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty good. Next week, we're going to be wrapping up this series with the epistles. Of course, I don't call it epistles because it just sounds a little like the letters. I like to say letters a little bit better. Epistles. You have to emphasize it just right. It's another way of saying the letters. These are, these are the letters that are written to the New Testament churches. They're like God's love letters to us today because we're his church. And so it's like love letters. Oh, I cannot wait for that. But again, I got some today I want to share with you. Not last week, not next week. This week, we're talking about the Gospels. Who's excited? Who's been waiting for this one? You've been waiting for this one, right? Man, let's, can we just talk about Jesus? All this prophecy and stuff, man. Let's just hit me with some Jesus today. And that's what we're going to do. Um, the, 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 the gospels are essentially the story of Jesus. It's, it's his story from four perspectives, which complicates matters a little bit. It's like, I, I got three kids, two of which are still at home. They can't get their story straight. Absolutely not. No way. There's some, you know, someone starts crying there's blood. I go out there. What happened? Emma tells me her story. Well, you know what Maddie did was, and then it's like, and then I ask Evan, hey, what happened? You know, well, what Warren did was, it's like, come on, come on, you guys pull it together. But the gospels are so unified. They're, they're so on the same page. It's like four witnesses to the same event. But I want to talk to you a little bit about um, just what we can learn from the similarities and from the differences um, about, about these. So what's 
what's his story? What's Jesus' story? What's the story of these, these presenters? Actually, that's what I would really love to talk about is these four guys, these four guys right here, because they're four different stories from four different people. The first is this. The first is this, Matthew. Matthew, the first of the, of the gospels. Matthew is the story of Jesus from an outcasted Jew. The story of Jesus from an outcasted Jew. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's so important. Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans because Israel didn't have their own land at that time. Rome took over and let them stay, but you had to pay taxes here. So what Matthew was doing at the time is he was working for the enemy. He wasn't just working. He was collecting money for like the enemy, the oppressors. Matthew was frowned upon, frowned upon in that culture. It's, it's, one, it's like a slap in the face. It was a slap in the face from their own people. It's one thing to be abused by your enemy. It's another thing entirely to be exploited by your own family. To be exploited by your own family. Nobody say amen. Okay, but it is worse. It is worse. From the perspective of an outcasted Jew, this is the most Jewish centered gospel there is. There's the most references to Jesus as Messiah. It starts off with this long genealogy of how, of how Jesus came from David. And so this was from a Jewish perspective to the max. And a tax collector is like an accountant. So I'm going to account to you all the ways that I can see that this is our Messiah. Speaking to Jews, because most of us here are Gentiles, we don't understand the importance of that these, these Jewish people, they were waiting on their Messiah to come. They were waiting. They were expecting. And Matthew's coming and saying, I, I will show you how this is our guy we've been waiting for. Matthew chapter 5, he says this. Don't misunderstand why I've come. Well, this is Matthew recording Jesus talking. And remember, this is from a perspective of Matthew, an outcasted Jew. And he records this. Don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses. You see what he did there? He's saying, I'm not, uh, we're not throwing out the Old Testament here. This is the fulfillment. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Now, from an outcasted Jew's perspective, and because you, what you need to know about Matthew is too, Jesus came, saw him as a tax collector, and said, come follow me. I can fix this. You an outcast, we're going to fix that right now. And yours is the perspective that I want uh, of, of someone who was an insider, someone who was a Jew, but still is, but is now working for them. But I'm going to redeem that. I'm going to redeem that. This is all coming from someone who was redeemed from exploiting his Jewish family. Jesus said, I can fix it. Come follow me. So Matthew's story was from the perspective of a redeemed outcast. Someone ought to say amen right there because you know what that is like. I do. I do. Number two, Mark. Let's talk about Mark. The Jesus story from a man of action. The Jesus story from a man of action. Dangerous, thrilling. This is like the classic promo for an action movie in a world where they're waiting for the Messiah to come. Boom, 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 boom. This is the man of action. And I'll show this to you. It's dangerous, thrilling. There's no time for a genealogy. The very first chapter is, check this out. <laughs> read it. Like read the very first chapter. It's coming straight from the beginning. This is uh, John Mark, as he's also known. John Mark, who also became a companion of Paul and is talked about in the book of Acts a little bit, gave us the shortest, most action-packed gospel that we have. And it portrays Jesus as Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Big, strong, and he'll be back. Come on. It's like, that's, what, that's what he did. That's what he did. Watch this. In, in Mark 16, he says this. These are the last two verses of his whole gospel. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor in God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miracles. Can you hear it? It's like all action. Of course, that's exactly what Mark would say because he was a man of action. He wanted to show us from his perspective that this is not, this is not some, some passive, like what, this was action. This was happening as miracles, people getting like revived from the dead, like all of the action and people suffering because I guess Mark preferred the action Bible to the old King James. I don't know what to say. Like he, the action Bible is a comic book, everybody. It's I got the animations and everything. It wasn't invented. That's why it's funny. Okay. It was funny. <laughs> Believe me. That was funny. Mark teaches us that Jesus was a man of action and so are his followers. Mark's story was the, from the perspective of a man's man. So let's talk about this next guy, Luke. Luke. This is where we start to start having some real fun here. These last two are, are, are my favorite. 
Luke is the story of Jesus from an outsider. So not an outcasted Jew. This is an outsider. This is a complete outsider. There's, there's order in this book like no other. Much more than we're used to seeing in any Hebrew literature, actually. Because Hebrew literature up to that point was much more poetic. It went beginning, end, middle, middle, end, beginning. And there was a lot of mystery in Hebrew. But, but, but Luke was a Greek. Luke was a Greek doctor, and he wrote this for another Greek person. So this was as an outsider to an outsider. Watch, watch what it says right here. Luke chapter one, he says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I've decided to write an accurate account for you. Most honorable Theophilus. That is not a Jewish name. That is about as Greek a name as you could have Theophilus. The great Theophilus or whatever his name is. You can be certain of the truth, everything we're taught because of the order. And this is why I believe this is America's favorite gospel because that's what we like. We don't like a lot of mystery. Like in the Bible college, all the questions are like, well, what about this? And the professor every single time is like, well, that's a mystery, isn't it? And the Bible is filled with mystery. Luke, not so much. It's like, this is how it happened. This is why it happened. This is exactly what's happening. As an outsider, two outsiders, Luke has the most references, by the way, to lost things being found. In the a whole chapter, Luke 15 is about a lost coin, a lost sheep, and then a lost son, the prodigal son. We find that only in Luke. It's, it's interesting that Luke would say, hey, lost things, you're found now. Coming from an outsider, that hits a little different because Luke knows what it feels like to be an outsider and to be lost and actually be found. Jewish people don't feel that way. Jewish people feel like I've been found since the beginning. All right, I've just been waiting for Jesus to show up. I'm good now. But Luke is like, no, we were on the outside, now we're in. We were lost, now we're found. It's powerful. What Luke also brings up is more references to women in leadership ministry than any other gospel. Any other gospel is very, very interesting. He, he, he portrays women as active participants in Jesus' ministry. And so like from a Greek perspective, from an outside perspective, they needed to know that. They needed to see that. Luke included that more than any other gospel, by the way. By the way, Luke teaches us that, that Jesus took outsiders, made him insiders, which leads us to the biggest insider that we could possibly have, John. John, the gospel of John is written as the story of Jesus from the inner circle. This is the inner circle. I don't know if everybody knows this, but there was 70 followers. There was like 120. There was the masses. There was 120. There was 70. Then there was the 12. Most people know about the 12, but then there was three, Peter, James, John. John was one of the inside people. Bro, bro, John, so inner circle. I can't even tell you all the things Jesus did. Man, I was just there all the time because I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, by the way. Yeah. Because watch what he writes. Like, you never saw this before, I, but it's hilarious. John 21, Jesus also did many other things, but, you know, if, if, if I couldn't write them all down, if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world couldn't contain all the books that was written. I was with Jesus so much, man. I just couldn't, I couldn't record everything, you guys, because I was there the whole time. It's like, okay, John, whoa, I, I get it. You were on the inside. And what do we learn from the inner circle? Love. Love from the inner circle. John is the one that, I have it in my notes, 57 times John references this, this concept, the idea, the word love. It's more than all the other gospels combined. Love from the inside, from the inner circle. What did he learn? All the trade secrets? All the, well, this is how you pray to cast out a demon. Oh yeah. Oh, and this is what you do to, no, he learned love, love. And then in his very first letter, the, the letter of first John, we'll probably talk about this next week. He wrote another 46 times he brought up the word love. And that's only five chapters, y'all. That's a lot. That is a, that is not just a theme. That's like the whole, the whole thing is all about love. That's what we learned from the inside circle. John's story was, the, was from the perspective of the inner circle. And he learned how to love and how to be loved. John's gospel also records how, how Peter came back after betraying Jesus. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And we see that forgiveness story. 
You know, we, we hear about the last supper, but did we hear about the last breakfast? You know, when, when, when Jesus found all, when, when Jesus called to Peter and had him catch all those fish and then they were eating fish together, that's the last breakfast of Jesus. And that's where they're sitting around the campfire and, and Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? John is the one recording that because from the inner circle, that's what we see. We see love. And so as I was thinking about the whole category, because this is a category I wanted to teach you, not just preach from the gospels. I want, what is the main idea of the gospels? Which is a huge question. I could spend years preaching just out of the gospels. Isn't that right? Like there, it's, it's everything to us. But the big picture of the gospels and what I wanted to like step way back 30,000 foot view is like, why narratives? Why is it a story? Four times it's a story. Why is it like that? Why did God choose to write through his word, through these four in the story, in story format. Because it didn't have to be like that. It could have been recorded much differently. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. We didn't have to have the privilege of it being a story. Because I think God understands something that I want us to understand today is that stories hold power that nothing else in the universe has. It's the power of, of imagination and the power of making something come to life in our mind. A story does that like nothing else can. A story can invoke even more than real life because we can see ourselves in it. We can see so much. That's why I think it's, it's all about the story, the fact that it was a story. It's his story. And it, my, my question is, is, what's our story in all this? What's our story? What's your story, in fact? What's your story? And the follow-up question to that might be, how do we tell it? How do we tell our story? And, and why is that important? Why, why are we taking from all the gospels, this category, why are we choosing to focus on story? Why am I choosing to, to now teach you how do you tell your story? Why your story matters? Why your story is so important? I'll tell you why. Out of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. This is John, by the way. This is John, the same, the same John. Revelation 12. They defeated him, talking about the devil, talking about the enemy of our soul. They defeated him by the blood of the lamb, Jesus sacrifice on the cross, and what else? By their story. Do you ever notice that it's like, it's both of those things? And why a, they overcame by a story? Appreciate how much sense that doesn't make. <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But in this context, now it kind of does. The story of Jesus was brought to us in a story. So what about your story? Why does it matter? Why do we need to think about our story more often than you currently are? I can... I would bet you all the money in my wallet. <laughs> it's not very much. But <laughs> all the money in my wallet, you haven't thought about your story very much or thought about how to share it or how I, can, how I can craft it, how I can use it as a weapon to overcome my enemy. But that's what we're gonna do for the rest of our time today because I think it's important. If we overcome by the blood of the lamb, by receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior and by the word of our testimony, I think, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it to investigate this idea. People can argue with the Bible. They can't argue with your story. It's, it's your story. It belongs to you. It, it holds power that nothing else has. Your story, like all stories, has three parts. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Are you mind blown? Are you, no, you, you, know, you know that part, right? But what I want to show you today is how you can use that very simple concept to actually internalize your story and share it anytime. I don't care if you're on an elevator. I don't care if you're passing someone on the street. I don't care if it's like a, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. What's been going on? <laughs> Let me tell you what's been going on. Beginning, middle, end. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time doing. One, two, and three, how to tell your story. Beginning, middle, end. Number one is this. The first part of your story is where you were. I'm, I'm teaching you how to, how to share your testimony and how to know your testimony. Number one is where you were. Every story has a great opening. But what most people don't know about a great opening is a great opening creates tension. This is something that public speakers know. This is something that public speakers are taught. I was taught this. I, was, I learned this. Is that if you, don't, if you don't capture people with some tension, they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, how good is, is everything in your life? Cool, 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 cool. No, we need to tell stories the right way. Which the gospels do this, by the way. There is a problem that needs to be resolved. 
There is an angst that, that, needs, to be, that needs to be fixed. There is something inside that, that, is, that is hurting, that is broken. It needs to make people ask, what's going to happen next? And I want to take you on a journey through John chapter 9. So if you have your Bible with you, I know I don't, you know, tell everybody to bring their Bible. I basically tell everybody to, to open up their apps. But if you want to open up your app, that's cool too. John 9. We're going to actually just go right through it in John 9. And we're going to see this principle in action, beginning, middle, end. And I'm going to disclose what these different parts are. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Jesus was walking along. He saw a man who had been born blind. He, had, he was blind from birth. What is that? That's tension. Someone's blind. They were blind from birth. And the disciples are asking maybe what you would ask, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? That doesn't seem fair. Was it because of his own sins or was it because of his parents' sins? And then, and then Jesus goes on to say, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. What is that? Tension was created right out of the gate of this story. It happens over and over and over again. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I want to know if, if you've ever considered, if you've ever considered the, the things that have happened in your life, that maybe they happened so the glory of God could be seen in your life. That is a tough pill to swallow. You're like, how could God let this happen? You know, whose fault was it? Was it God's fault? What is it? Well, Jesus said, at least in this case, this case it happened because the glory of God is going to be seen in this. There's a verse that lots of people like, God uses all things to, to, for, the, for the good of his glory. If all people who, who believe in him and are called according to his purpose, God uses all things to work together for the good, blah, 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 blah. It's this concept that Jesus said, no, 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 no. This happened because the power of God is going to be seen in him. The power of God is going to be seen in him. So when you're starting with your story, I want you to consider the things that you've been through. Consider the things that, like, what, what is your story? What is your story? And you know what that, that's going to do for people? It's going to create common ground. When you, when you start with a vulnerability, you're creating common ground with someone. Because if you start with all your victories, all your accomplishments, all your wins, it's going gonna, it's gonna to detach you from someone. But if you start with, you know, something that you've, you've been through, like, you know, uh, anxiety, depression, whatever, or maybe it's a big story like mine, but our weakness invites God's strength, and God's strength is best seen through people's weaknesses. I want you to start your story with the things you, you've been through. The first part of your story should highlight a life-defining trial, a life-defining trial, and I want you to find it. You know, what is it for you? Maybe you're like me, and it's not hard to find what that trial is, everybody. Maybe it was, maybe it was drugs and crime, you know? Maybe it was, a, maybe it was a, an actual trial <laughs> that you went through, judge and jury and all. But maybe your trial is more under the surface, and many people's are. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's, and I want to tell you, more people relate with you than you think. In fact, less people relate with my story than they will with yours. You know, what, what does that look like? You know, I used to struggle with, with depression, anxiety. I used to be aimless in life. I used to have, you know, it's, it's your story, not mine. But I'm just trying to encourage you. You have a story. And you have a starting place for that story. People think, this is ridiculous. People think that if you weren't in a biker gang, you don't have a story. Yes. Come on, guys. Come on, please. Are you, are you serious? Like, nobody has a testimony? You gotta be, have a, you gotta have a hell's angels, angels jacket to, like, have a testimony? No, 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 no. You got to go to jail? No, come on. Let, let's, let's be reasonable here. None of these disciples went to jail until after they met Jesus anyways. They have, they have stories though. And they have things that they, they went through. I want you to find that for yourself. Your story does matter. What you went through, more people are going to relate with that than you think. Divorce, bankruptcy, addiction, maybe an illness. What is it for you? And that's going to that's gonna give God glory. And it's going to create common ground for people so you can share that. And it's God's strength is best seen through your weakness. Remember what Jesus said. This, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. This happened. That happened. Your situation happened because the power of God is going to be seen through that in you. Your trials make your story stronger. So find it. Jot it down. Jot it down. So number two is this. What happened? This is, uh, you know, this is the part where you're going to share what, what God did in your life. You know, how did you get rescued from that? What, 
where, where, did the, where did the needle start to turn? Where did your direction start to turn? Because your story doesn't end in your trial. A lot of people think it does. <laughs> a lot of people I talk to think it does. <laughs> That's the only part of their story they want to think about is the, is the trial. But your story doesn't end there. This is the fun part. Now watch this in John chapter 9, verse 6. Jesus spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, spread the mud on the blind man's eyes. I think we're going to make a life group out of this. <laughs> Spit and mud life group. No, I'm just playing. Don't do that. Verse 7, he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. That's, my, that's the best pronunciation I got, so don't even try to make it better. The pool of Siloam. The man went and washed and came back seeing. Verse 10 says, who healed you? They asked him, who healed you? What happened? That's what they want to know. What happened? We know what your trial was, but we want to know what happened. What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes, and he told me, go wash in the pool, go wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Nine words. That's what happened. And in Greek, it's only five. What I'm trying to tell you is what happened in your life should be concise, should be tight. It's when did God show up somehow for you? Because he did. Even if you have trials now, we're going to get there in a second. Just hang in there. Even if you still have trials today, even if you're still in progress, chances are God met you someplace. He did something for you. He changed your direction. He showed you something. He took the veil off of your eyes. Maybe he didn't sp and rub Mud on your eyes, but something happened. Something happened. The second part of your story should be simple, not overstated. It should be short enough so you could tell it on an elevator ride with a stranger if it comes up, yet complete enough to answer the question, what happened? Listen, everybody, I've shared my story so much. I've got three versions of it. And this is, this is useful to you now. It's not just about me. It's about you. I've shared it so often that I know that there are three versions of it. There's the 60-second version. The one minute version, there's the, there's the five minute version, which is like when I'm at dinner with someone or we're having lunch together and there's like, there's a small group of us and they want to know, hey, what, what happened? There's like a few minute version. And then there's a 20 minute version, which is almost never used. Only when I'm invited to like a banquet or a share your testimony event, almost never. 20 minutes, it's too long. It's too long. Like, like you will never, probably never, but maybe you will need that. The most important by far is the 60 second version. That's how long your story should be. It should be one minute, one minute. Because when, when someone walks by, hey, how'd you get to Lodi anyway? Hey, how did you become a pastor, pastor? Like, how did that happen? I need to be ready. When I'm at the gym and someone's like, you a pastor, what? How'd that happen? I don't have 20 minutes. And if I take 20 minutes, I did it wrong. <laughs> Because they didn't want to listen to that for 20 minutes. I, it needs to be 60 seconds, and, and I'll, I'll show you the, the last part, but it should just take 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and when it's over, it's this right here. Hmm. That's what it should do for some, huh, I never knew that, wow. And it, it gets them think, because your story matters. Your story has power that any advice you give someone doesn't have. I get stuck in that too, advice mode, you know? How many of you know that a story has so much more power? So when someone walks by me at the gym, or when I meet someone at the gym, it's the only place I go, by the way. It's the only place I meet people. <laughs> the golf course, rarely. You know, it's, you, you group up with four and then you're gone. But in the gym, when, when someone asks me like, what happened with you? What happened with you? You can tie me if you want. It goes something like this. I used to struggle with, with drug addiction. I was lost, I was hurting, I was lonely. And I was just stuck in that life. I was in and out of jail. And I was a father who wasn't even in my son's life at the time. I was so lost and desperate that I prayed to a God I didn't even know existed. And all I said was, God, if you're real, get me out of this. That night, I got arrested for the very last time. And they sent me to a rehabilitation center called the Salvation Army. I met Jesus. I gave my life to him and I never looked back. Now I have a, a beautiful wife and three kids. And even though I still have struggles and problems, I have infinite amounts of hope that God has forgiven my sin and I can make it through any storm that comes my way. That's my story. And it took me 40 seconds. It's, and it's the whole thing. And it's, it's, it's you, I cut out all the fluff. And I've told it so many times. I can tell it just like that. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is we 
all need to have that. Because I only go to the gym. You go to your job. You're the one working with all these business leaders out here. You're the one that's talking to all these single mothers that, are, that, are, that need some hope in their life. You're the ones out there in the world. You need to learn to share your story so you can be a lifeline in this community. It's the way. It's what God instructed us. This is how we overcome the enemy. By the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. So how come we don't talk about this? You know, I, I give cards to you and I'm like, hey, hand these cards out which is cool and all, but do you know your story has so much more power than a little QR code that goes to me talking again? It does, and it should, and it does. I went and washed, and now I can see. I went and washed, short, simple, powerful. So I used to go to 12-step programs a lot. I used to go to NA, AA. If you've ever been there, don't raise your hand. You're supposed to be anonymous, okay? But no, there's in these meetings, if you've never been there, in these meetings are an hour long, sharp, right? And then there's a, there's a, the main person, I forgot. And then a chair person is on the side, I think. Um, the secretary is the main person. Thank you. It's been so long. And then there's a chair person on the side. who's supposed to bring their story. There's always two different kinds of stories that get brought. The five minute story and the 55 minute story. <laughs> Lifeline, what I'm teaching you right now, don't be the 55 minute person. Nobody likes that person. Don't be that. If you were that person, I forgive you. We all forgive you. But learn to be the five-minute person. Even if you're given a platform, even if you're given a moment, learn your story better so that you don't have to like grab it, that you can share it because it's a weapon. It's a tool. It's a gift. You can give it to someone and it'll change someone's life. I want you to know how powerful this is. I could go on and on, but I, I need to finish up. And you probably guess what the last thing is. I mean, the number one is where you were. Number two is what happened. And number three is where you are now, where you are now. This is the hardest one. This is the hardest one because this is where people don't feel qualified. This is where people think, well, I, where I am now is I suck. <laughs> and where I am now is, you know, I'm not perfect. But what I want to show you is it's a different perspective is that of course you're not. If you were perfect, you'd be in heaven already. If you were perfect, you would have died for my sins, not Jesus. Of course you're not perfect. That's not, that's not where you are now is not perfection. So how do you describe your present stage? Yeah, you got your eyesight back, but you still got to pay taxes. <laughs> Life is still hard. You got your eyesight back. You get married and you still fight with your wife every once in a while. Like you got your eyesight back, but life's still not perfect. So does that mean you don't have a testimony? Does that mean you're not doing it right? No. Watch this. So powerful. This is how the story ends. John 9. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the son of man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. That's a very roundabout way of saying, it's me. <laughs> like, why don't you say that? It's me. And then the man said, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. That's where the man is now. He has a relationship with Jesus. That's where he is now. That's, that's your story. That's where you are now. Remember how I told mine? Even though I'm not perfect. Even though I still have lots of problems and I'm a work in progress, I have hope in me that I can navigate these storms. As they come, I can navigate these storms. That's where I am now. That's my hope. Where I am now is, well, now I'm a pastor. So I'm good. No, I'm not. And neither are you. You know you're not. I know I'm not. Good. That's not this man's story. That's not what the man is saying. That's not my ultimate achievement. The ultimate achievement is he has a walking relationship with Jesus. That's his victory. And it's yours. It's your story. That's, the, that's where you are now is you're walking with him through the good times and the bad, through the mistakes, through, the tri through all of it. The great ending to John 9 is not that the guy got his eyesight back. That's not the end. It's that he, had, that he had his relationship with Jesus. The good ending to your story is not that you got your wife back, that you got your job back, 
that you got your dog back, you got your truck back, everything you get back when you play the country song backwards, you know, not that you, what you got is not your victory. It's your relationship with Jesus is your victory because stuff comes and goes. It comes and goes. That's not your victory. The great ending to your story is that you've given your life to Jesus, I hope, and that you have a confident hope in salvation and that in Christ, you can navigate the storms of life. That's where you are. That's where you are. That's the win. Regardless of any success you've experienced in life, and I hope you do, I hope you experience tremendous success. But if you're walking with Jesus, that's your victory. The third part of your story should be about your progress, not your perfection. I give you permission. You don't have to be perfect in your story. In fact, you shouldn't be. Because you'd be lying. Don't lie. Biggest lesson from church. Don't lie. Tell the truth. You're in progress. But see the real truth is that in Christ, you can navigate all the storms of life. And there's, all, there's always victory at the end of a life in Christ. Always. Every single time. I got some extra credit for you. Write your story down. <laughs> write it down. There's like a half page on your bulletin. You can write it down anywhere, but it should be short. It should be like short, short. If it was me and I was sitting where you are, I would take those three categories and I would put just a few words where you were, drugs, crime, hopelessness. What happened? Faithless prayer, basically. Flare prayer, Salvation Army. Where you are now, living with Christ, with my family. For you, it will be different. Your, where you are now will be a little different, but that's good because there's someone out there that needs your story, not mine. They need to hear your story, not mine. They need to hear about what you went through, not what I go through. Write it down, make it short. You have the choice right now to let what you've been through haunt you or help you and help others. It's your, the choice is yours. You can let it haunt you or you can let it help you. Maybe you're feeling like you're stuck in the beginning of your story. Is there anybody in, in here like that? I, I'm stuck in the beginning of my story and I'm, it's, it's where I was is where I am now. The struggle is where I am now. The problem is where I am now. You feel like all you have to share is the pain. Trust me, I get that. Maybe you came today ready for the narrative of your story to change. And if you are ready to, for the rest of your story to unfold, I have good news for you. Jesus is alive. He died for your sins. And he sent his Holy Spirit to be with you right now. Amen. In this moment, today, so that you can have a fresh start whenever you're ready for it. And I pray that you are. So if you would say, if you would say, I'm done with this, the chapter of pain. I'm done with the, the chapter of remorse. I'm done with the chapter of regret. And I'm ready for the chapter of living with Jesus as my victory and the victory for others so I could be a lifeline to myself and to others. If you're ready for that next chapter, I'm telling you, he's ready. And he's been waiting for this moment longer than I have. And I've been waiting. I, I want this for you. I want this for all of us, that you would receive Jesus and that your story would be complete not because you're perfect, but because you've given your life to him. And that's the greatest story ever told. And it's told over and over again by millions and millions of people. And I pray you would be one of them, that you would let go of the past and let God into this moment right now to make you new. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes together. Church, come on. Special moment. Father, I ask for open hearts and open minds today. I ask that your spirit would be present among us and that we would be receptive to everything you would have us do in this moment. So I do want to speak to everyone here, everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice online and in person. If you're ready for that, if you're ready for the story of your life to continue unfolding, but in Christ and with the hope that comes with Christ, if that's you, whether you were walking with him before or whether you're starting right now, no matter who you are, 
If you're ready for the next chapter of your life, you're ready to walk that chapter with Jesus, would you shoot your hand up for me? Say, that's me. Yes, I see you. Yes, 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 amen. If you're online too, this goes for you. Come on, anybody else? Yes, I see you too. Yes, I see you. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. Everybody, if you would pray this prayer after me, let's pray it like a family would pray together. Just say it right after me. If it's, if it's in your heart, just pray it right after me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. I'm ready for that to be my story, that he died for me, and I receive it. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Amen.